output, we can do a full POP. Moving on to femur shafts, fractures, hip fractures. So in the absence of x-rays, like we've had at Zitulele, we, we kind of often have to make a clinical diagnosis. So um, the position the patient lies in the bed, in the bed tells you a lot. The picture on the left, shortening of the limb and internal rotation with that adduction. And that's just the classic picture of a, either a hip, um, a, a usually fem femur neck fracture. And if they lie like that, then do the x-ray, it's probably broken. Um, if you look at the, the second picture, that's number three, there's just the leg is still in a nice straight position, but it's shortened. Then you're sitting with Mitchell femur fracture. In the, in the picture on the, all the way on the right, with the foot lying out like that, that's usually where you start thinking, could this be a hip um, dislocation? So, um, sorry, I'm mixing up. The, the last one is more likely to be the femur neck. The first one is the hip dislocation. So going on to femur fractures, gallus traction is a very underused, underutilized way of traction, but you've got to pick your right patient. It works incredibly well. It's probably my favorite traction because it's so non-invasive. Um, and the kids, though it looks terrible to be hung up like that for a month, um, they adapt so quickly and they actually are happy campus most of their admission. But you got to pick your patients right. Two years old, no more than 12 kilograms, maximum 15 kilograms. If they get heavier than that, the traction is too much on the, on the um, blood supply between the femur head and the, um, and the acetabulum and, and you can actually cause avascular necrosis that way. So under 15 kilograms at most, you just put in normal skin traction and um, hang them up so that you can just slip your hand under the buttocks. That's all you also do every day as you do the ward round. Is the rope still you know, nicely tied and can you slip your hand under the bum? Um, remember kids of this size with femur fractures, you've got to ask yourself, could this possibly non -accident be a non-accidental injury? So just make sure we don't miss domestic abuse. But the suggested management for femur fractures in kids under two years, gallows. Two to five years, um, skin traction, they heal so quickly. They are usually within six weeks, a month, six weeks, they heal. So you can just put them in skin traction if you can't get an operation for them. Obviously, they would also benefit from ORA. But then uh, traction and uh, anti-rotation boot um, just helps a lot. It's, it's probably enough. Five to 11 years, uh, RF is ideal. They do these flexible nails or plates these days, and oh, the kids are just being able to, to mobilize so much quicker. Um, and older than 12, this is one of the cases where it's worth fighting for RF. Um, RF, uh, the femur, femur fractures are very forgiving with 15 millimeters of shortening and 30 degrees of angulation. That's acceptable. Um, but uh, they don't do well with rotation. You can just imagine if, if they rotate, then you're gonna walk with a foot like that or even worse that, and you're gonna you know, bump onto everything. But they are even shortening, they're very forgiving. Um, but as I said, I think the ones worth fighting for is for the adult femur fractures. In the meantime, so I know this is probably, this is, this is a big problem. I remember December, coming out of December, um, at Zitulele where we sit with three, four, five patients that's been waiting for 60 or 90 days for operations because December is just orthopedic Christmas. So we've got, the, we basically, what we tend to do is you, you admit the patient, they go on to click saying, um, so that they don't develop DVTs, you monitor them for um, pressure source, you put on skin traction, and then you need to keep them in good skin traction until you can get them either for the RF or when you reach 60 days. We would say 60 days, if there's good callus, then we send them home for another month of bed rest at home. Um, and, and a lot of people, that was all we had available. Um, for the anti-rotation boots, I've tried a couple of them. Here, here's three pictures. Um, so the, the first one we, we it's just you do a normal pop with a piece of wood in the back that just you can just imagine you can't the the, the leg can't fall you know outwards um but what tend to happen here is after a couple of weeks the cotton wool we we wrap 
in the leg in become so compressed with the moisture that they develop pressure salt. And people would you know, meet me in ward rounds and say, this is too painful. And when you take it off, they've already got the blisters or pressure sores there. So uh, I, I didn't like this way of doing an rotation. So then I welded a, a 90 degree frame. The fishes added some nice padding and we wrapped the foot with traction, obviously going through the frame. And this worked quite well, but I ran out of iron. So then we made it with cheap um, wood. And this technique also actually worked very well because you can just reuse that little box. You fold the, um, the, the, the um, mattress around, you wrap around the foot. Funny if you get in a cold winter's day, you would get to the ward run and then find two feet in, in there because it's nice and warm. But it, it was very effective actually to keep the, the um, foot nice and straight. In the meantime, the femur heals in the, in the correct position. Um, because if we ended up with 60 days, 90 days in traction and no orif, then at least it heals in the correct position. Um, so that on anti-rotation devices, we almost done. Um, posterior hip dislocation. So if you think about it, hip dislocations, if you sit in a car with your hips flexed, you drive into another car, you get bumped on the dashboard, the hip forces out backwards. That's by far the most common way to, or, or um, the, the um, most common dislocation for a hip, a posterior hip dislocation, where the shoulder, remember, is anterior dislocation. So the posterior hip, you just reduce it. We want to reduce it within six hours to prevent avascular necrosis. Sometimes we luck in, we still don't see the avascular necrosis, but the risk becomes very severe after six hours. So you want to clinically pick it up. This is not the patient with a foot that's lying in internal rotation after accident um, that you just leave until you get there because they're not crying. Um, this is when you send for x-ray. Just have a quick look. Okay, it's not a dislocation or it is a dislocation. I'm going to, you know, prioritize this. Um, remember, you can also get acetabular fracture or sciatic nerve fractures. Um, and I think sometimes you realize even though you try your best, you can't reduce it because there's soft tissue interposition. I've had that where you try and repeat it or you reduce it and then it just pops out again. Those are the ones you would discuss with orthopedic surgeon and, and um, refer. But the technique to reduce them is quite simple. It's a big joint with big muscle surrounding it. Um, so one would expect it to be very difficult. But I think this is the patient I... Either take to theater, or if you can do this safely in your recess bed with all the ventilation things handy, is the one I will give my one, the conscious sedation dose, one milligram per kilogram propofol, maybe add some analgesia, and then I climb like this picture. I climb on the bed with the patient. I actually slip my arm under the um, popliteal fossa behind the tibia, and then I pick the patient up straight with the femur straight upwards so that they hang on the, their own weight kind of like reduce it. and then i just I, sometimes you have to stand like that for a little bit with a with a um leg over your arm so that the muscles just relax and then i would pick them up and just give a little bump like that so their own weight kind of like um reduces and it's a lovely pop and it goes back it's actually a very easy reduction yet again the sedation, the, the relief need to be in the muscle relaxation need to be there to be able to overcome the big muscles there fighting you. Um, but the, the important take home message is this need to be done as quickly as possible. Um, just after care, skin traction for four weeks, rest for another two weeks, start mobilized. If there, there's a rim fracture, um, you're going to start the mobilization after eight weeks. If you're worried about any fractures, always unstable, you refer, because then what we do at a secondary tertiary hospital is we CT scan and we go look exactly. And it's actually very big operations to fix acetabular fractures. So hopefully not, that's not the case. Um, I think this is my second last slide, but probably one of the most important ones. Femur, a pelvic fractures are one of the very severe orthopedic emergencies. When the pelvis fractures, you've got the risk of the um, venous plexus in the posterior over the sacrum having a tear and you can bleed easily up to three liters back there 
filling up that uh, um, space without you seeing or noticing it and the patient can be become very unstable so you need to stabilize the pelvis and you can quite quickly do this with a pelvic sling wrap it around tighten it as tight as you can um, remember that you need to screen for urethral or vaginal injuries also um, and this is usually open uh, urgent referral obviously this this is an unstable pelvic fracture the open books I'm not going to go into detail there, but this is the ones you worry about, discuss them and, and pelvic sling. You can rather do the pelvic sling and then the orthopods can laugh at you afterwards and say that wasn't necessary, then, then not do it when it was needed. Um, the mortality rate of open pelvic fractures is something like 50%, I think. So open pelvic fractures, you know, stabilize, wrap them, um, get them hemodynamically stable and refer immediately. Um, which brings me to my last slide and, and my take home message. So, in, and it's on advocating for your patients. So, we've got very, a lot of different districts in this country and sub districts providing care where we work. And some of the orthopedic departments are well organized in these districts, and some is very poorly organized. And I think we need to learn which cases to fight for and when it is not with your energy. So I think knowing enough and doing your best is, is, is obviously important, but we can actually sort out 90% of orthopedics at level one district hospitals if we do these basics correctly. And we can help 90% of our patients that way. Um, and then we need to learn when to, how to pick the ones that's worth fighting for. I, these three quotes in the bottom, I write, all very important, but I love the one on the, on the left. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Okay, so um, we sometimes we like, I mean, good example, the ankle fractures. We can't, we fight and we can't get them to accept the patient to do RF, but we can at least get that joint as a, near as perfect as we can and it's worth a try even if it, we end up not doing it perfectly it's at least better so it's yeah picking the battles and then not to um yeah choose your battles wisely because if you fight them all you'll be too tired to win the really important ones um that's my whole story i hope that was helpful um and uh, madeleine said she will um Keep uh, make this uh, PowerPoint available so you can use it in your hospital if you want to refer back to it. Thank you very much. Wow, <laughs> I'm impressed. That was a marathon session. Amazing. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm actually going to break it into at least four different parts so that one can easily find. We'll put the times on as well because um, you don't have to go through all of them if you want to quickly revise a collies or a supercondylar or a or a tibial fracture or whatever, but that's an amazing resource. And I think what's always useful are those little practical tips of stuff you can do in a, in a rural hospital setting. Um, so there is definitely, I know we've gone, we've decided early on that we will do the whole presentation, even if it's gonna go over time. Um, but if anybody would love to ask questions, you're welcome to either put them in the chat or just unmute. Um, at the moment it looks like, I think everybody is amazed <laughs> um and then just to uh, do a prompt for wednesday night so we definitely this week in the world of surgery and orthopedics and anesthetics and so on wednesday evening we're going to have prof david bishop who's a dcst anesthetist from kzn and regularly does webinars with the rural doctors there on tips for anesthetics and he's going to look very much at some top tips for anesthetics in your rural health setting so definitely look out for that on Wednesday night. Um, and then next week, um, we're going to be moving on to pediatrics. Our webinars will be on Monday and Tuesday night, and we're going to do some, some on the, on, yeah, go, go to the Little East. Um, and thanks very much, Hans, for also including some stuff on the children. So that was a real nice, uh, comprehensive family medicine presentation on fractures. Thank you very much. I'm just looking in the chat here if there's any Oh, there's a quick question there um, on post-reduction. Is a circular pop necessary? We were trying to only do back slaps post-reduction, Hans? No. So if you're ever worried, do a back slap. 
but the, the one exception where I always do circular pop is a college fracture because it's it's um, you you it's the one fracture where the the POP and the position flexion on the on the deviation is going to keep the position, and if you do a back slap over this and you take it off a week later, you quite often can lose it. So um, also, I mean, use common sense. If if they broke it like an hour ago, doing a circular pop is maybe the swelling is still going to happen. But usually, what we see in our patients is a day or two later that they arrive, and it's already either swollen maximally or already the swelling is going down. So by reducing it and getting in the POP. I've never had a patient that came back with compartment syndrome that we had to split the POP. Um, I mean, never say never. So you do have to have, you know, at least your three or four layers of, um, of cotton wool over the, the fracture line when you reduce and you, you put it in that circular pop. But it's, it's, this is for college fracture. I actually go straight into a circular pop. For kids, forearms, any fractures, um, supracondylus, definitely back slope from the word go and then replace it in a, in a week. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, it's those little details. Um, I think that's all our questions. So I'm happy to close the presentation here. Um, tomorrow I'll be sending out your resource pack for you on orthopedics um, and surgery, I hope, and then later this week on anesthetics. Um, and we'll be at, by then we'll also have all the links available for, for the webinars this evening. There's also lots of great ortho sites with um, some great uh, videos and we will, we, will, we will post you some of the, the better channels to go and look for, for some of those reductions that um, Dr. Hendricks mentioned. Thank you very much, um, everybody. And um, thanks very much, Hans, and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Enjoy your night. Bye-bye. <laughs>